Welcome to another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast with me, James Roberts, transformational coach, two-time Paralympian, and TEDx speaker. I have another awesome episode for you today, so let's get straight into it. And on today's show, I've got Scott Odom. Scott was diagnosed with bone cancer when he was 14, which resulted in the loss of his right leg above the knee. When Scott would hop around the house without his prosthesis, his mom gave him the nickname Thumper. Since his cancer diagnosis and the loss of his right leg, Scott has went on to become the first above knee amputee to play in a professional basketball game and also co-founded a non-profit ABI, which he hosts benefit charity basketball games to help kids with cancer and their families. All the money raised at these events go directly to the kids fighting cancer and their families. He's also wrote a children's book, titled Me and JC, which shares his personal story with a powerful message. For the past 20 years, Scott continues to serve as a camp counselor at Camp Sanguinity, which is a camp for kids with cancer and blood disorders. Scott has been featured in numerous newspaper websites and magazines such as the LA Times, ESPN, Online, Slam Magazine, and many other media outlets. So welcome to the show, Scott. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. So let's let's start off then in terms of uh, what's your what what is your early story before the cancer? Because I'm assuming you would play basketball because you played to, to quite a high standard with, with videos that I've seen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was a big athlete. Uh, baseball was really the sport that I loved the most. So I was really act, more active in baseball, actually. But I played football and basketball. We, it was like a neighborhood thing, you know, grew up in a neighborhood where everybody would go to one person's house either to play, you know, pick up games in the street, football or baseball. And then whoever had the basketball hoop at the time, we would go over to their house and play basketball. So, yeah, I grew up playing. And then once I got into, like, middle school and all that, you know, starting to get more organized type sports. But anytime I wasn't playing youth sports, we were always playing in the yard or driveway, stuff like that. So, And what was it like for yourself as a 14 year old, but also for your family from a mindset perspective to be diagnosed with cancer? I mean, it was a big shock because um, about a month before that, before I got diagnosed, a month before that, I saw a family doctor and I was in the room maybe two minutes and pressed on my knee, moved it around. Does this hurt? That hurt. And I said, no, yeah, no, yeah, you know. And we were about to start. I was about to start high school. And so I was coming off uh, the All-Stars in baseball that season. And so I was trying to get ready for two a days to start um, for high school as a freshman. And so my main thing was I just wanted him to say I was okay to play. I really didn't. I knew something was wrong with my knee, but I just wanted to be like, it's not that big a deal. You can go play, which that's kind of what he told me. He said, you know, here's some pain meds. We'll stay off of it for about a month, and then you should be okay to start two-a-days freshman football. So did what he said, stayed off of it, which was hard, you know, because I wanted, I'm always active and playing, but stayed off of it for that month. And it didn't hurt, obviously, because I wasn't doing anything, you know. It was already kind of the summertime, so I wasn't really doing anything, video games of that. But um, as soon as freshman football started, um, we were doing two-a-days early morning practice, and my knee just – the pain started coming back. And each time it came back, the pain got worse. And, I mean, I would just be standing in line for a drill and having to, like – I couldn't stand still because it was like a throbbing pain in my knee. And I was always the type I would never complain or say anything. So I just, my whole goal was I wanted to, one, get that. I always thought the Letterman jacket was like the top, like cool thing to have. So as a starting high school, that was one of my goals was to do that. And then obviously I wanted to play college and all that stuff. So I, I wanted to do everything I could just be on the field and be out there. So even though I was hurting, I just kind of just would play through it. But this, at this point, the pain got so bad. Like I was, I couldn't run full speed. Not that I was a fast guy anyway, but I couldn't run. Coaches knew I wasn't running as fast as I could. So they were making me run more because they thought I was, I was, you know, it's high school. You got to be more aggressive and stuff. And I was, I finally said, Hey, I can't like my knee is just killing me. And then I had swelling around my knee 
And so the trainer thought I had fluid built up in my knee that maybe they need just need to go drain it out. So that's when they sent me to their team doctor, which is like an orthopedic specialist. And he took took an x-ray. First time anybody took an x-ray the whole the whole time, the whole four years, my knee's been hurt me since I was 10. First time anybody took an x-ray. And he said, yeah, I don't really like, there's like a cloud around your knee. I don't really like, so let's do an MRI. And then the MRI came back. And it was actually the first day of high school and they diagnosed me with cancer. So a month before saying I was fine, I'll be okay. And then, bam, you've got this cancer that if we don't do anything quick, it's going to spread and you'll probably die from it. It was, it was kind of, it was kind of hard to believe at first. So what, 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 what did you have to do in terms of to, to deal with that? Cause ultimately that's quite an old deal uh, for an adult, let alone a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember the first, when they told me I had cancer, um, my mom was in the room with me. And so, I mean, especially as a kid, you hear cancer and you just think the worst. You think, you know, I'm going to die from this. So I wanted to ask that question, but I kind of wanted to protect my mom in a sense because I know like, she was already crying. So I asked her to leave the room, actually. And then I just asked the doctor straight up, like, is this one of those really bad cancers or is this a cancer that I would take some medication? You'll be fine. And she's like, no, it's it's very serious. And if they don't do anything like quick, it's going to spread and then I'll die from it. So that's when it really hit me like, oh, man, this is serious. And I just remember everything around me was just like a fate, like a like a fog. Like I couldn't really people were walking down. all, just seemed all blurry around me. It just seemed like an outer body type experience. Um, but then the very next day I had to go have a port put in my or they had to do a biopsy. I'm sorry, just to confirm that it was cancer, which it was. And then that next day after that, they put a, two ports in my chest because that's where I would receive the chemo. And then I think maybe a day or two after that, I started chemotherapy, which was which was rough. It was really rough. And I did about a year and a about a year of chemo. So that must have had a massive impact on your high school experience then. It affected it greatly. Um, like I said, I got di- the school that I was at. Um, I grew up in a. I grew up in Everman. Uh, which was uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes from the school that we, the town that we moved to right before I, I got into eighth grade. So only the town that I moved to was Joshua. And so I only had like my eighth grade year in Joshua. So I was still kind of the new kid. Um, and I'm very like an introvert. I'm very shy, very quiet. Like sports was just my outlet to kind of be around other people. But if I didn't have sports, I just, I probably could say two words and be fine all day, but um so i only had eighth grade year so i didn't make a lot of friends except for like people i played sports with and then that next year i get diagnosed and so the real friends that i had were back in everman still and so when i started high school and then i'm out my whole freshman year and then i'm out the first semester of my sophomore year i didn't go back to high school until my second semester of my sophomore year and clicks and all that were already kind of formed and of course, when I'm on chemo, nobody can really be around me because, you know, my white count, everything's down. And, you know, if they have a cold, I catch it. It's 10 times worse. So I was isolated a lot that whole year. And then me already being a very uh, shy, quiet kid, my self-confidence and self-esteem were just at its lowest because I was bald. I had I was missing a leg. I was at 14, 15, I thought girls were cute. And I was just like, there's no way some girl's going to find me attractive. So I had all this mental stuff I was trying to overcome. And then I get thrown back into high school. And it was just, it was rough. Like I, I didn't, I don't think I talked to a whole lot of people. My whole high school career, I was there and sports was it. Like I went back to play baseball, but I think without baseball, it would have been really hard to go back to high school. Um, for, well, you say you went back to base, but was it like a catalyst to reignite that confidence that you lost then? I think so, yeah, because that was one of my goals uh, when I was doing my treatment. Um, and I kind of what helped me continue to like paddle through the chemo and all that is I just wanted to get back, get back on the field, get back just playing sports again. And so that was one of my goals that I set for myself. And so once I got my prosthesis and then, learning that reality of it's not as easy as it looks type thing, like learning how to walk again and all that, which was like a long rehab. 
So when I got back to high school, I wasn't running like I am now. And so I actually was in off season in basketball because basketball season is before baseball season. But when I got into basketball season, I just knew I wasn't ready. Like I couldn't run yet. And I didn't want to be the pity kid on the team. And so I was just like, I'm taking myself out. Like I'm not ready. And so I went into baseball off season and I pitched before. So I knew as a pitcher, I didn't have to be as mobile as I am in basketball. So, yeah, that was definitely a confidence gainer for me, knowing that, you know, once I was doing it and then I was pitching in some games and doing pretty well, it was definitely like, all right, I can do this, you know, no matter what other people may have thought of me or thought I couldn't do or anything. It was it was definitely a confidence booster for me. And obviously you've made that a passion of yours to be able to share your story and kind of show the, the, the strength that you've obviously overcome. You've had probably like, well, You've had the cancer, you've had overcoming the uh, having a artificial leg, wearing a prosthesis never before. Are you just trying to showcase what is possible? Because ultimately, um, about me growing up, I I read Slam magazine, so that's quite an, that's quite an achievement for somebody who likes basketball. That's kind of uh, to be to be on that to be featured in that alongside probably. NBA and, and NCAA college basketball is a massive achievement. So my hat's off to you for that. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was that was a crazy thing. Uh, I think one of the, when I was starting to start doing the basketball thing, um, this guy up in New York, uh, he's pretty well known in the basketball community, Peter Robert Casey. Um, he saw one of my like local news stories that they did on me down here in Texas. I don't know how he saw it in New York. He said it came through like his Google feed or something. And so he actually reached out to me uh, through social media. I think it was MySpace at the time or something. I can't remember. You're showing our age now, though. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he reached out to me and he said, hey, let's talk. I'm a basketball guy. So we've talked on the phone and I come to find out he's this like pretty like legit big guy in the basketball. But besides that, he's just a really – real dude he's a cool dude and so I, till this day like he's probably one of my good friends we've never met in person we always talk about how one day it'd be cool we, if we could meet in person we've had opportunities where you know when he's here in texas you know we've tried to like link up it's just never happened yet but um he uh he's the one that kind of vouched for me at the time when i wasn't really getting a lot of support and so he reached out to the people he knew and they knew this person, and that's how I kind of got the slam and the, the Sheridan hoops and the ESPN and all that. It's, it's mainly this guy. Yeah, he just really believed in my story, believed in my mission, and more than anything, he knew what my heart was and really, what I really wanted to do. Like, yeah, I love basketball, and I do want to, like, showcase, like, I, you can do anything, but at the same time, like, I'm doing this as a tool, really, to help other people. And I think that's with my nonprofit now, and you know, really just giving God all the glory because he's got me through all this. But, and he really sees that. And so I'm very thankful for him and just the opportunities that he's given me just to reach out to other people through the media that he knows. I think, I think it's trying to showcase that, especially to the younger generation. And sport is a vehicle, opens many doors. And ultimately, if you create lasting relationships that you're talking about, Scott, ultimately it goes, it goes both ways. It will serve you back if you reciprocate yeah. in the right way. So, um, and it's something that I, I talked about when I went back to m one of my alumni universities of if you cultivate those relationships now, that's somebody mm -hmm. you can rely on in the future. And, and obviously that is probably something that is a lost start of, you know, proper mm -hmm. communication because of social media. Uh, but, yeah. Ultimately, you can use, as you've attested to, social media for good uh, from that. And ultimately, that's how you and I have connected via, via Instagram. And pretty much I reached out to you for you to come on, on this show to, to share your story. But that being said, coming back to you, so I don't sidetrack, which I've got a, um, a, a bad habit of doing, uh, going off on a tangent. Okay. So if I come back to you, of being the first amputee to play to play professional basketball, what did that mean to you, more specifically? Uh, that was that was actually a big turning point for me. Um, 
Uh, before that, obviously, that was one of my goals, you know, was to be one of the highest, you know, athletes as an APT, especially in basketball. And so when I got presented that, it was actually a guy that knew Peter Robert Casey that he were, uh, gave him my contact. And then me and this guy, John Solomon, we connected and started talking. And John was doing like the sport agency thing he was trying to create on his own. And so he knew somebody that had a pro team that was a coach up in Michigan. And so, you know, they got to talk in and he was showing my video or just the stuff we were doing. And so they, they both called me on the phone, John Solomon and his coach um, called me on the phone and said, uh, we'd like to invite you for like a, to be like a one day contract to come play on our team. And at first I thought it was a joke because, uh, I was like, I'm short, I'm white, I got one leg, like, I just, <laughs> I'm, I'm not that good. Like, I, I can, I know I can play, but I'm, I'm not at that level. Like, I knew that in my mind. And they were like, no, 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 like, this will be great. So they were, I thought they were trying to convince me, but I could see that they really believed in me and what I was trying to do. And so I, I looked at it more as an opportunity, like, I'm not going to go out there and drop 20 and triple double. I'm not going to do that. I you know, if anything, I'm going to go out there and just show people, like, if you work hard, if you they dedicate something you can you can have an opportunity like this one day. but when I got to the gym you know the day of the game and I, I meet the team and part of the coolest guy I met on the team was a guy named Mo uh, he was he's been working really hard trying to get in you know make the NBA and the pro level and all that stuff and so I really clicked with Mo and he was really a big uh we we got to chop it up even before the event so he made me kind of like calm my nerves because I was super nervous you know, again, I'm short, I'm white. I'm like, oh, like, I don't need to be out there. And we were actually playing, the team we were playing, they were undefeated. So they were, like, killing all these other teams. So I'm like, great, you know, the, the game I'm playing, we're playing, like, the best of the best. And these guys are, like, six, seven, six, eight, And, I mean, just freakishly talented group of guys. And so John's actually the coach of the team that year. He got moved up to coach or something. I think, yeah, he coached. It was the owner, I'm sorry, the owner that contacted us. But um, John said he was going to start me, which I, you know, I had questions about because it's like, all right, I didn't want it to be a pity start. But, again, I knew he believed in my ability. So I was like, all right, I can do this. So I was second-guessing myself a lot, which I think, you know, it's maybe kind of normal in that sense because I didn't want to go out there and be like, you know, I'm this – this really good amputee that can hoop and I can compete. Like I knew my ability and I knew like, Hey, I'm not at y'all's level. And I respect it. I wanted to give them respect too. I don't want to be out there and be one of those amputees or be one of those athletes that, you know, could just be, I think I'm better than everybody. That's not my mentality. So I, I wanted to show them as much respect as possible. So me starting, I didn't want to disrespect anybody that was been working all season and me come in and be a starter which everybody on the team was cool with. They could see what this was all about. Um, but even, like, during the game, you know, I made a few shots. Mo actually assisted me on the first shot. But even after the game, I just was like, all right, this is not it. This is not what I was called to do. This is not what I'm supposed to do. I'm not supposed to be this pro player that I thought, you know, since I was a kid, my big dream was. I remember this little kid coming up to me after the game. He was probably three or four years old. He, he had this big jersey on of the, the team, the Admirals, and he had a basketball in his hand that was probably bigger than him. And his mom came up with him, and she's like, he he could not take his eyes off you the whole game. Like, he was just pointing and talking about you the whole time. And so I am I get really, like, touchy with kids. Like, that's why I do so much with kids nowadays is because I just – I want to help kids as much as possible. And so I got to meet this little kid. I got to talk with him, and it just kind of clicked with me right then. Like, all right, like – I don't need to be out here proving I can compete with these guys that are proving I'm this great athlete. I just, I need to use what God's given me, my talent, my ability, you know, to give back and help other people, especially kids. And so at that moment, I knew like, all right, I got to switch something up. And that's when I kind of left the organization I was at. And I uh, started my nonprofit shortly after that ABI. So it was a big turning point for me, for sure. Do you think because your nonprofit is, involved in something that you've had to endear with yourself it's it's more of a calling and a, and you've got a higher purpose yeah most definitely yeah i mean 
I knew, I knew like I wanted to do something sports wise, you know, and it was kind of a learning process going through it. Cause I thought, you know, there was never stand up basketball before. So I was like, well, that, that just didn't make sense to me. Like there has to be stand up basketball. You know, when I got to stand up, I was like, all right, well, this isn't it. You know, I was, I was always, I was always going off a of feeling, kind of feeling where God was leading me. And so every time I would hit a wall, I'm like, oh, this isn't it. Or this doesn't feel right. Especially with the, the pro game. It's like, yeah, it was a cool experience. You know, I got to be on ESPN top, top top 10, all that stuff. And I was like, this just isn't it. It's not what I'm called to do. And so when I started meeting other kids, especially when I go to like elementary schools and share my story and testimony, I'm like, all right, like, I think that what I've been through with the cancer and losing my leg, you know, you kind of go through all those, you know, self-consciousness or depression even at times or questioning your ability. Can I do this? And then trying to stay committed to something, dedicated to something. And then when everybody doesn't think you can do something, you know, you really just need to believe in yourself. And if God's giving you that talent ability, it's going to happen. And so I think with me staying consistent through all this, all these years, and me just really listening to him and not other people is why I've gotten this far. And the nonprofits kicked off, you know, as far as it's gone. And I just, that's the kind of message I want to give the kids because I know how hard it can be, especially a kid or somebody going through kind of what we've been through, losing a limb or anything, or even cancer. It's it's a, a big part of it. It's a mental part of it. If you can break that mental part of it and just be confident and secure, and who you are and what you want to do it doesn't matter what the outside or anybody else thinks. Like if you know what your, your area is and your calling is like, it's going to happen. Well, that's the challenging part. And it's got, cause you talked about self doubt. And I think, I don't know if you agree with this. The teenage years were quite troublesome anyway. The challenging yeah. for an able-bodied person anyway, just cause they're trying to find themselves. Exactly. But you exactly. throw on, you and I can were similar because I, I obviously lived through it with, with a prosthetic as well from my teens. But obviously you've got the cancer on top of that. You, your confidence is all over the place in terms of, well, you're talking about clicks. How do you fit in? Um, that's probably what I'm, I'm maybe a little bit more extroverted than you. I'm not an out and out extrovert. Um, people would probably find that hard to believe as me being the host of a, of a podcast of being, but I think it, it you would agree with this. It, it, the, the spotlight that sport gives you is like, oh, I like this because I have some yeah. control over it. Uh, but in terms of coming back to my point about the, the self doubt, you're always questioning what you perceive other people think of you. And especially as a teenager, that's difficult because you kind of say, well, they view me in a certain light. And because you're res reserved and quite shy as we were, you're never going to ask people what you really think. Oh, whether or not they tell you the truth is a different story altogether. But in terms of that doesn't help to squash those negative thoughts that you might have at that particular time in life. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. And it's, it's kind of one of those things too. I think it's kind of just in us as humans, you know, we're, it's kind of hard for you not to think, what does this person think? Or am I, can I fit in with this crowd or what it, I think the big thing that hit me or the hardest part dealing with all that was my senior year in high school. Um, when varsity or when I was a junior, I was on JV. And so I had all the coaches I had before I had cancer. So they knew who I was. They knew the type of athlete I was, person I was. And so when I go to JV, it's all the same coaches. And so I get to playing games and I'm doing pretty well. And doing, you know, for a kid with a prosthetic leg, like fitted in and blending in, I'm, I feel like I'm part of the team. You know, I feel like, all right, I'm getting back to that groove. And then my senior year, we get all new coaches, <laughs> brand new coaching staff. And our high school was not very good in baseball. So we didn't win a game all year. But I didn't get played. I didn't get involved in practice. And so that was like the first taste of reality that, okay, I'm being judged basically because of the way I look. Like they're just looking at my prosthetic and being like, ah, they didn't know what to do with me. You know, and it's probably no, you know, as older I get, it's probably no knock on them. But at the time, I was really like upset, frustrated because I'm the first one I practice, last one to leave, doing everything I can on my own. 
and like nobody's talking to me, no coach, nothing, you know, as an adult, not even, it's like, I'm like, they don't want to like, they're scared to like talk to me or touch me because they just, they didn't know how to handle me, I guess. So I remember the, before the last game, I finally built up enough courage and I just confronted the coach and I said, you know, if you want me to quit, like I'll just quit. And I said, we've won no games. I could understand if we're fighting for a playoff spot or whatever. I said, but we've won no games. You're pitching the same guy, two guys over and over and over. And I said, we're getting blown out some games. And it's like, you can't even throw me out there to give me a shot. And he's like, well, no, no, I keep meaning to put you out there. And I'm like, dude, like, don't (laughs) just stop with all the, (laughs) just stop with all that. Like, God. Just be man to man with me. Like, if you're not going to play me, like, I'll just quit now. I don't want to come to the home game. Like, I'm done. And then, sure enough, he starts me the last game. And I was upset about that because I'm like, well, this is a pity start. It's just because I said something. And then I pitched, I think it was like the second inning. And the other team, they they were up, I think, two to one or two to two. And they bunt it four guys in a row, which is unheard of in baseball. Like they just bunt it and then bunt it again and then bunt it again. And then it was just because I wasn't quick enough to get to the ball, you know, so they were taking advantage of it. So I just remember staring down the third base coach, like for real, man, like you're already winning. Like this is our last game. And he just would not look my way. And I just was just staring at him. And then coach finally took me out and I just bawled. I was like, this is it. Like, I'm never going to – people are just going to look at my leg and just think I can't do anything. And so, like you said, teenagers, you're already going through those emotions and trying to fit in. And then, bam, you get hit with this hard reality. Like, people just don't take you seriously as an athlete or don't think you can do something because – so I hit a major depression after that. And then I think the thing that was kind of pulling me out is, like, I didn't want somebody's opinion of me or somebody's view of me to determine my worth or what I knew I was capable of doing. And so that's when I was really trying hard to start the basketball thing. And then, you know, along the way, I found my faith, you know, and just feel like, you know, if God's kind of pulled me through all this and everything I've been through. And so I shouldn't let somebody else's opinion or somebody value of me base what I value myself or really what he values of me. And if I'm called to do something he's called me to do, as long as I stick with him and trust in him, that's going to happen. And I think as long as the way my story has been going after all these years, I mean, it's hard not to see that he's been in all this that, that I've been able to accomplish. So it's not really me doing it. It's him doing it and me just trusting in him that I trust that it's going to happen somehow. You took the uh, the high road, though. You were looking at the, the base coach. You could have thrown. Well, could've, I'll tell you what. You I, could have actually I'll thrown be, a pitch at the players. <laughs> so. oh, I, I, I had the ball in my hand. And I was gripping it very hard. And I was like, if he looks my way, I, I just wanted to throw the ball at him. That's how I'm mad I was. I wanted to throw it at the third state coach. Like, I was just – I was out of it. <laughs> I was already upset because the whole season. And then that was just like breaking the iceberg. And then when he wouldn't look at me, I was just like – I and I've never been in a fight in my life. I'm not a confrontational person. But I think that was the point where I was like, really, man? Like, this is just not the way to do it. I mean, it is what it is. It's an experience. I guess. I see. You managed to keep your your temperament somewhere. Yeah, that was probably the one time. That's probably the one time I almost lost it. Like I was, like I had the ball in my hand, and I think God was like, "Just chill out, man. <laughs> like hold my arm back." Because I, in my mind, I was like, "I'm just gonna throw the ball at him. Like, what do I have to lose? Like he's being a jerk." <laughs> but I just, I'm thankfully I didn't. Because yeah, that's not the right thing to do. But. But yeah, that's probably the one time I got really upset. Well, there's diff- there's uh, numerous of scenarios that could have gone a different way. In terms, of you throw that ball at him, and you maybe hit a parked car or something like that, or some- yeah. something a lot worse. It, it wouldn't have been. Yeah, it wouldn't have been good. So, yeah. <laughs> thankfully, I was able to control. So, if we fast forward to now the present and to two years ago, with you becoming an author. Talk to us about why you wanted to to write a, a children's book in the first place. Uh, well, I wrote a book back in 2011, just kind of about my story. It was like a very small self-published. I didn't get out there a whole bunch, but like I said, I do a lot of stuff with kids. So the camps that I go to every summer, the kids' uh, cancer camp, and then I've been to a lot of schools in the area and all that. And so I just, everybody kept asking me, like, are you going to make it a kid's book, making a kid's book? And I just thought, like, I... Like, I don't know how you would write a kid's book. And so 
kind of feeling that nudge over and over. And then the hospital that I did all my treatment, they, they call me quite often to come mentor some kids, talk with kids that are about to have the same surgery that, you know, I had or facing that decision, you know, to save it or have it amputated. So I always felt the calling felt like I could do it. And then I, you know, just, I was tired. I need to do this because it's been, that, it's been nagging at me for a while. So I sat down and did it. But about halfway through it, I didn't want it. I didn't want the book to be about my story again. I wanted to have like a message to the book. And so the reason that it's called me and JC, it's the relationship, you know, that I have with God and, you know, everything. And so the way I kind of talk about it is, um, which you probably know this better than anybody too, is, you know, we don't have to wear our prosthetics. Like it's, it's really a choice. I don't have to wear it. Like I don't, I don't every, every morning my prosthetic, prosthetic is next to my bed on my nightstand. And when I get up in the morning, I have to make that decision. Like, yeah, I'm going to wear it or no, I'm not going to wear it. And if I don't wear it, it's, it's no big deal. It's, you know, it's my choice and I can go on about my life. But um, if I'm putting on my leg, I'm making that commitment that, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to trust this and work at it and be okay with it. Now, in the beginning, it's very tough just because I remember when I put my prosthetic on for the first time, it was very hard. I could barely walk like two steps. It was, you know, kind of like a newborn baby learned how to walk. And I was like, how, I can't even walk. How am I going to run and play basketball and all this stuff I want to do? So the only way I, you get to that point is, you know, you got to have that commitment and that um, of doing it every day, putting your leg on every day, working up to it, those baby steps, goals and goals and goals. And then eventually it kind of becomes second nature. Or eventually you build this, you, you fully trust it because I remember in the beginning, I would always look down at my leg, making sure my foot was there. If my heel wasn't just right, it was going to buckle. And, you know, that's a scary feeling. So I didn't trust it at all. But the more I'm wearing it, the more I'm putting it on, the more I'm practicing with it, then I'm fully trusting. It. So where now, like, I don't even look down when I walk. I can just go and, you know, run if I want to run, go backwards because I fully trust my leg. So in the beginning, it felt like I was putting something on me, like a, piece of metal or something on me whereas now it's a part of me it's just who I am my leg is who I am so I think the same kind of goes can be said you know with my relationship with Christ you know JC is every morning I have to make that I have to make that choice you know I'm either going to follow him and try to do what I feel he's called me to do or I can be stubborn and be prideful and all that and try to do it my way which I'm going to fail every time if I do that and so, you know, just like with me fully trusting my prosthetic, you know, it's it's taking that step and I'm following that step as I go over the, the toe and over the foot. And so just as I'm following God and things he's called me to do, it may seem impossible and I don't know how I'm going to do it. But if I trust and fully trust him that way, you know, doors are open and stuff's going to happen because he's going to make it happen. And so that's kind of the message I have with the book. That's why I tell it that the, the JC is um, the name of the prosthetic. And so the leg actually talks to him when he's having that hard time feeling like he can't do it. I can't walk like this is too hard. The leg actually talks to the thumper saying, you know, just trust me, you know, don't give up. I've got special plans for you. You know, there's a purpose in your life. So it's kind of a, a tighter message that it's not like in your face, but if you kind of look into it, the message is there, which that's kind of what I wanted to get to people. So, well, that, that probably could work with an adult that in terms of because so people get some context coming from your audience into mine. I'm born with the disability. So I've obviously done it since I was six months old. So I have no I have no recollection to compare against, whereas you have got right. another life before that. So I think for an adult right. that has had a traumatic experience, be it cancer uh road traffic accident um if it happened to be in the military except an ied it's a possible it's a good message to kind of say okay okay maybe i have to think a little bit more broadly in terms of yeah the leg's not likely to talk to you but it gives you a sense of the the, the health workers will be saying to that you need to trust them because it is quote unquote a part of you and um it's something i had to tell the client it it, it is and isn't a part of you it's, you have the right. benefit uh it's not it's one of a handful of disabilities that you can 
put it to one side and, and leave it alone. And like you say, it's a choice you put it on and you take it off. Thus, I think I use like transformers to make my point as well. That's a bonus. Some people have to live with the, their impairment day in, day out. We have the luxury. Okay, so it is a bad day that we aren't wearing it, but there are some days that you don't have to wear it. You could use an, a, another aid of be it crutches, your wheelchair, um, walker, etc. Et I won't go into that too much because ultimately that people view that n- those as negatives because it's going to take a backward step. But I think your book looks at it in um, a different way as, okay, you need to ultimately trust it because this is now your new normal. And it's a, it's a thing too, where it doesn't really have to, I mean, just for me, prosthetic and like for you, that's, that's my life. So that's what kind of what I'm related to, but I mean, people are going to have a hard time or a hard trial in their life, whatever it may be, you know, for me, it's prosthetic, losing my limb, learn how to trust that, but a prosthetic could be something else in somebody else's life, yeah. you know, where there's some addiction or anything like that. And so, but the main thing is really just the message of, I mean, it's a message of faith, really, and hope is just trusting that, you know, there you do have a purpose, even though you are going through a hard time and it may seem like it's raining every day and there's hard days all the time. Like there is hope and trust, you know, when you do trust and have that faith that, you know, anything is possible and um, that uh, it's just it's really hard to to do it at times because of all the hardships. Because, I mean, even though people say, man, you've had a hard life, it sucks. Like, no, not really. Like, I've met kids that are had way worse stuff than, you know, way worse cancers or cancers multiple times or whatever it may be. And they're probably the most happy, hopeful kids I've ever met. So it's inspiration like that. Kind of why I got this book is, you know, every, even if people haven't had a hard time in their life, it's going to come. Like, we, we're all... Nobody's accustomed, you know, immune from it. We're all going to have hardships in our life. Um, so the message of the book is really just having that hope in Him and trusting in Him, no matter what you may be going through. You know, you do have a purpose, and you can use that bad, that bad situation in your life and make it into something beautiful and something positive. To where not only does it help you, but you're able to help other people. You know, just as I'm doing with my my nonprofits. Are you to test to this? Uh also um scott of you know sport teaches you learn from more from losing than you do from winning and, and i like what you yeah. say learning a lot from adversity it is perspective yes it's an all deal and and it's rough at the time but ultimately that that hardship that you faced and i'm talking to, to whoever listening as well is a lesson for somebody else because that adversity you faced and you're willing to be vulnerable with it is motivation and inspiration for somebody else. Okay. You are willing to talk about X, Y, Z. Okay. I, I, James is willing to go or Scott's willing to go deep here. Okay. Let me, let me uh, challenge what I've got an issue with. And I think people like, will commend me for being vulnerable. It's like, well, it's only that I'm ready to deal with it and that's it. It's like, it's the, or, or sport has probably taught me as it's black and white. It's like, okay, it's not that difficult. Boom, put it out, put it out there. But I guess the, the, the message I'm trying to echo with this is it's a confidence booster that we talked about earlier in the episode. We've got the confidence and the, what's the word I want to use? Um, it gives us a, like a kind of a superpower. It's not the right word I want to use, but I'll use that to, uh, because it enables us to kind of showcase uh, uh, something that others at times feel unable to do. It's like, well, this is a vulnerability. Here you go. This is what I've overcome. This is what I, I learned from it or you can learn from it. Here's the solution, so problem solution. But I think because as athletes, uh, and this is something 
it took a guess to pin to point it out to me as and I didn't see it as clear cut as this before he said it. Of because we do it repetitively, face adversity, be it in practice, be it in games on a daily basis, if not weekly basis, we're pretty much analyzing our lives all the time. So when we step into the real world, it's not difficult. Whereas most people maybe at times at best maybe analyze themselves twice a year so christmas and and um or their holy month depending on what religion they're in and their birthday and that's about it so they don't have the the skill set or the rep repetitiveness to be able to look at things in a multiple different ways as okay you chose you chose not to throw that baseball at I'm assuming the dude's head or somewhere at it, at him. You chose you chose a different path versus obviously the worst case scenario. Most people put into that position are obviously going to react in a negative way. Yeah, I mean it's definitely a perspective, and uh, just kind of learning. I mean, like I said, we're all going to have those hardships and. It's how you overcome that as well and dealing with that. It's it's very easy. It's very, I guess, even for you too, just to feel sorry for myself, lay in bed, oh, I can't do this. Or even if I see stairs, which I hate stairs, but if I go upstairs, like I just know it's not fun, but I can do it, you know, just not having that pity party type time mindset and so it definitely helps to, to get it out because I think especially in my teenage years I kept it all in I didn't talk to anybody I felt super alone and so you know when I had that vision of playing basketball and stuff I thought I was the only one in the world that wanted to play basketball because nobody in my area or I would never see anybody playing basketball standing up and then when I put the video on YouTube and saw other people reaching out like, Hey, I want to do this. Or, Hey, I, I do this too. Like it was, I was like, all right. And then you meet those people that have kind of been through what you're going through or close to it or overcome something. It's definitely a big motivator and inspiration to be like, all right, like I'm meeting somebody, I'm seeing somebody with my own eyes that have pretty much had what I had or worse. And they're, they're happy and they're doing it and they're okay. It's definitely a big motivator to be like, all right, you need to get over yourself and, just keep pushing, take it a day by day. And that's the big thing too, is I would set these really big goals and that's all I would focus on is that big goal. You know, so I'll take for instance, going to the, being a pro player or whatever. That's, that's all I would focus on, but I would kind of forget about the steps to go into getting to that goal. And so I'm a big part. The big thing that I preach now is like, just it's a day by day thing. Like just, all right, well today, what can I do to reach to work to get closer to that goal in a sense because even with my nonprofit, like of course i would love for it to be bigger than it is i would love to put on more events all over the country but right now we're just a very local type nonprofit, and so as much as i would love to get to z you know the big goal i know like it's it's a work in progress and so that's just with like just with us learning our prosthetic, you know, putting it on is, is a goal in itself, learning how to put it on for the first time. Because I remember the first time it would take me like 10, 15 minutes to put it on and then I have to take it off because I didn't get on right. But, you know, a process to where now I can put my leg on 30 seconds and be out the door. So uh, just focusing on that, too. And but. Having having a community and other people um, like like mindset as yourself, um, goal oriented as well is, is a big help too. And when you do start having those days where you're doubting yourself or getting hard, it's it's nice to have people in your corner to kind of lift you up, you know. Because we all need that at times, you know. I think we all, no matter how much you've succeeded or how much you've overcome, you're gonna have days where just have a, a down day you just feel like nothing's going right or it's hard or whatever and so it's nice to have people in your corner to, to be so there scott, for you as well scott you talked about obviously the first time putting on a socket let's rewind a bit to the the first time you had it fit in for the socket what was yeah. that like for you because obviously that's an experience <laughs> it is an experience i didn't know you had to get almost completely new <laughs> <laughs> And being above the knee, you have to almost get completely new. They put on like a thin little pantyhose thing. But yeah, it was, they casted me and I've never broken a bone before. 
So I didn't know anything about being casted. And so I just remember them casting my leg. My mind, I'm like, what? What is going on? Like, I don't know how this is going to work. But they did the test fitting. I put it on. And I it just, they kept asking. That was, a, and because I work in prosthetics now. And so I always tell them, but like, I remember them asking me, what does it feel like? And I'm like, I don't know what it's supposed to feel like. Like, I just remember them asking me questions. I'm like, dude, I have no idea, like, what to say. Cause, so I had a really hard time communicating with the prosthetist, like, what I was feeling. You know, whereas now it's like, all right, this is pinching me or, you know, this doesn't feel right back here or it's too big here, too tight. At the time, I was like, I don't know. I don't know if it's supposed to be too big or too I, I have no idea. So learning that was a, a big curve for me, a learning curve for me, but. I just remember standing up and they were like, all right, take a step. And I'm like, there's no way I can take a step. <laughs> I just, the, the fear of falling just overtook me. And I'm just like, I don't know if I can do this. Thankfully, you know, you're in parallel bars when you start, but it's a, it's a, especially for an above the knee, it's, it's definitely, it's a whole different ball game compared to below the knee. It's, it's more challenging for sure. Cause you have, you take away that knee joint. And at the time, calling my age again, but 23 years ago, the knees weren't like they are now where they're microprocessor and really safe and all that. So the knee that I had at the time was like a door hinge. It's very free swinging. So if I didn't land on my heel just right, I'm going down. And I went down quite a few times just learning how to walk. So, um, but yeah, I just remember being very scary. Just the fear of, of falling for sure. Well, I think that's, it's, it's, this one thing I learned about it is one of the human built it is hardwired into us as humans it's the fear of noises and fear of falling so pretty much if you have one one of those which i think probably every amputee does of yeah. falling over um i think i think males in particular i think in in our age group if you do you're looking around did anybody see it <laughs> <laughs> well yeah too and it, i think the fear comes from like i don't know i don't know what this is i don't know how this works i don't know what i'm supposed to do with it and so when they put it on you like the leg doesn't walk for you like you have to make it work like you actually the residual limb the limb that you still have that was cut off like you can move that that's how you can control your prosthetic inside the socket and you know being a new amputee, i didn't know that you know, so I'm kicking my leg out and my knee is just swinging like this. <laughs> and so I'm like, <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> and so learning like, all right, when I kick it out, I need to kick back to get my heel on the ground and then keep it stiff. Because if I take weight off of it, it's just going to buckle again. So it's really the fear comes from really not knowing what this is and not knowing how it works. And then thankfully, I had a good prosthetist that took the time. Um, you know, and really showed me like what this does and how it works. And if I do this, this is going to happen. If I don't do this, this is what's going to happen. And so it really just trusting her too, that whatever she says, I need to do what she says and not try to have like, oh, I can do this and have that, I guess, male mentality that some people may have, like, oh, I'll figure it out. Like, no, like you really need to <laughs> listen to what they're experts in this. So they know how this works. And so. Once I knew how this worked and once I got more familiar with putting it on, then that fear kind of goes away because it's, it's not the unknown anymore, if that makes sense. Do you think having that sporting background to ground you to, I won't say it's not a criticism, but to to listen to the prosthetist to to kind of say, no, her way is the right way my way is going to get me into trouble. Like you said earlier in the episodes, do you think that's what helped? Because ultimately you are conditioned to being coached. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, you can definitely take it as that approach as, you know, she's the coach. So what she says goes, but you know, I looked at her as she's, she's been doing, she's a professional. Like she went to school for this. She knows this stuff. And so once I, I, and for some reason, I just really clicked with her. Um, I just, I told, I remember the very first uh, prosthetic place I went to because uh, the hospital I was at, they said there's like three or four prosthetic places around here. Just kind of go around and pick one that you like, which is kind of crazy. It's like, I don't know how to pick one. But I remember the very first one I went to, I, I knew I didn't want to go there because 
Um, the guy took us in the back. It was just a console. We were just going to talk because I wasn't even ready to get casted. And it was an older guy. Um, but uh, I remember him asking me what I wanted to get back to doing. And I said, I want to, my, all I said was baseball and basketball. I said, that's what I want to get back to doing. And he's, and he, I remember the exact words he said was, well, and above the knee amputee, that's not going to happen. Like, it's just impossible for that to happen. So I looked at my mom and was like, all right, I'm ready to go. Like, why am I going to pay you all this money to make me a leg when you don't believe in something that I want to do? So the next one I went to was this lady, Phyllis, uh, Phyllis McNeil was my process. She asked me the same question. And I said, I want to get back. And she's like, I'm going to do everything I can possibly prosthetically so you can do that. And so that's when I just was like, all right, this is where I need to be. And so even when uh, she's been my process all these years, um, there was a time where she went to Maryland. Her husband got a job in Maryland. So I had to find a new process, which for anybody that has a really good process, that's like one of the one fears you have is oh, I don't want to find somebody new because you click so well with them. So I just, I got teamed up with this other prosthetist uh, at the same clinic and it was just night and day. Like I felt like everything I was trying to communicate with her that I built, you know, with this prosthetist, she wasn't getting, so my socket didn't fit right. And I was just like, oh my gosh, like, this is a nightmare. And so thankfully my, my prosthetist uh, ended up moving back to Texas about a year later and I heard through the grapevine, but where she was gonna be practicing that was like an hour and a half from where i lived and i was like i don't care i'll drive wherever <laughs> i almost was gonna go to maryland for her to make me like but it's like once you find somebody that good and really believes in you and it's gonna do everything you can i mean you'll fully trust them to be like all right what you say i'm gonna put to practice because i mean i think anybody that becomes an apt later in life I think they can be honest in themselves. Like you, you know nothing about this. Like you don't know how these feet work, you know how these knees work, you don't know how to carefully take care of your skin, sock management. There's so much that goes into this to get a good fitting sock, good fitting leg. And so, like what they're telling you may not make sense in the beginning, but just you have to put it to practice every day. And eventually, down the road, it's gonna make sense. You're like, oh, I remember them telling me that. Oh yeah, that's it makes sense now because if I don't do that. And I've, I've had issues where, like, I've wanted to play sports so bad, basketball. Like, I knew my leg wasn't fitting right, but I was stubborn and be like, I'll just play and play. And then I'm getting the blister because I wasn't listening basically to my body. And what she was telling me were, you know, if you start feeling me, take it off or put it on. Kind of gets from when I was time when I was younger. I just wanted to play and just live my life. And so... Uh, that's that's one advice I really tell people is whatever they tell you, like one, find somebody that you really click with and that you're comfortable with and one that believes in you and what you want to get back to doing. Because, I mean, if somebody is already telling you they don't see you doing that, then, I mean, that's just setting you up for failure and your mental thinking, oh, well, they can't think I can do it. I'm like, I can't. I must. I must. I can't. do. So, yeah, but and that's that's with probably, anybody. You're probably like me, Scott. You'd be if you were to stay with that guy, you would have butted heads, and it'd be well. Yeah, I I'm gonna challenge your belief because of it's probably based on the history of most people that acquire amputations are older. So thus, he's probably yeah. the, that with an older population that don't want to oh, for uh, sure, yeah, for sure, do yeah. that. So, but to put that on on you as a teenager it's like well who's to say you couldn't do it but ultimately you went somewhere right. else uh, and they believed in you and that that obviously reinforces that that's obviously what makes um i think great athletes who they are it's the, the people behind them and that yeah, sure. and that list of people could be massively long um uh, yeah. and, and things like that I know we're coming ta close to time of, of, of wrapping up the episode. So I want to ask you my penultimate question then. If you had to sit down with any athlete, dead or alive, for that matter, who would it be and why? Mm, that's a good question. I, uh, I would probably say this one because, uh, you know, going through cancer, you get a make a wish. And so I remember them giving me a make a wish and I was a big baseball guy when I was younger. And so I was a huge King Griffey Jr. fan. Like King Griffey Jr. was like 
my guy. Like I watched all his stuff. He had this hitting tape that I bought VHS and I buy it. And um, so anything King Griffey. So that's who I wanted to meet was King Griffey Jr. I want to go to Seattle, play catch with them, do all that stuff, hang out with them. And so, but I was so like self-conscious at the time. And I just had my amputation when they presented me this. I was like, well, I don't have my leg. I'm not going to be able to play catch with them. Like I, I had all these self-doubts going in my head. And so I was like, I'll just take a computer. <laughs> so I get this box computer, which I regret to this day because I'm like, I passed up on an opportunity to meet like one of my like heroes, sports heroes, King Griffey Jr. So it would definitely be him as a redemption. That way I could finally get that the real wish that I wanted was to meet him and hang out with him because I've always liked him. He's just, I like athletes like him that are just real kind of humble looking. They don't talk a lot. They just play and they're really good at it. And they just kind of let their, and work on the field speak for himself and he was just super talented just really cool to watch so it would definitely be part of king griffey jr and my last question before we wrap up the episode if you had to summarize what we've been speaking about into one sentence for people to take away what would that be uh it would probably uh never give up because uh with god anything is possible Okay, I appreciate that. Thanks again, Scott, for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. Yeah, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for all this and what you're doing. It's really cool. Appreciate it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks again for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed this episode and got loads from it. Anything that was included and discussed will be available in the show notes below. And I would love to hear from you. Come and connect and ask your questions. I've been James Roberts from jamesowenroberts.com. Remember this quote by Chris Hart. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think, and execute, not by some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete. <laughs>